The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. After Jacob's death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime that they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones in this way. He reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. The responsive reading is from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. You made known your word your ways to Moses and your works to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, and not being steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. The second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. This Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. 
All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us and will judge each of us. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. So he shares with them this parable. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold, therefore, with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. The slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. So out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave as he then went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat. And he said, pay me what you owe. His fellow slave fell down, pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused And he went and he threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? In anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So may my heavenly 
so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord for you this day. Please be seated. Peter asked Jesus a very honest and important question about forgiveness that I think all of us has asked of Jesus at some point in our lives. If you haven't yet, I'm sure your day will come too. Because it was the same question that was asked between Cain and Abel, between Abraham and Sarah, between Jacob and Esau, And we heard it again this morning from Joseph and his brothers. How are we going to get Joseph to forgive us? Or in Peter's case, how many times is Jesus should I forgive? How do we practice forgiveness together? And I just love Peter's addition Peter is always trying to help Jesus out, give him ideas for his kingdom. Don't you just love that? It's like when my kids give me ideas about what time their bedtime should be or ideas about how their lesser punishment should be. We start from a young age learning this survival practice because none of us like pain. We start from a young age and quickly learn how to get to the goal with the least amount of pain possible. When my mom told me she'd be home at 5 o'clock after work, I'd think to myself, hmm, that means I can watch TV till 4.30 and start my homework then. My mom asked me to clean my room before I went out with my friends. Hmm. I'll just throw all the clothes into my closet, stuff everything underneath my bed, and surely she won't know the difference. These are just some of the practices I have learned through the years. What about the practices that you have picked up through the years to get you through the least amount of pain? And the funny thing is, I honestly believe that my mom wouldn't find out. Isn't it? It's funny now until it's not. Until now I'm the mom. (laughs) And now I have to deal with these children who are now trying to pull things over on me. Then it gets real. How many times, God? No, really, God. How many times am I going to have to tell my children that they have to be kind to one another? How many times until they get it? And how many times do I have to lose it and scream and yell before I realize that maybe I'm a part of the problem too? How many times? My brothers and sisters in Christ, this message today about forgiveness is honestly no joking matter. I have counseled many couples on this. I have counseled many children on this. I have had to go through my own period of counseling on this. Forgiveness is probably the hardest thing we have the opportunity to receive and give to others. So I want to invite you today to just simply sit and receive the gift that Jesus wants you to hear this morning. Out of pity, the Lord has already released you and forgave your debt. Out of pity, the Lord has already released you and forgave your debt. Where else in our life today will we hear these kinds of words and promises? Surely not at our bank, not at our job. Surely not with the used car salesman or the loan officer. 
We don't even often hear these words being shared in our own homes and among our own families. So I want to wonder with you this morning, who is the person in your life who has modeled forgiveness for you? You see, in our Old Testament stories, we hear over and over again, we humans sometimes just don't get it. God gives us a second chance and a second chance from generation to generation, from Adam and Eve, from Cain and Abel, from Abraham and Sarah, from Jacob and Esau, from Joseph and his brothers, and all the way today to Melody and Eric and Anna and Olivia. You see, my husband and I talk about this all the time, how terrifying it is to see your own debts and your own sin and your own faults being now lived out in your children. It stops me in my tracks every time I witness it. And I beg God, how many times, Lord, how many times do I have to watch this sin being lived out in my own family? How many times? One of my favorite Bible passages is in our Old Testament reading this morning from Joseph. In verse 19, he says to his brothers, Do not be afraid. I'm not God. Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intends to do good in order to preserve what God is going to do today. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this word of hope is easier to believe when both the victim and the abusers are both on their knees weeping together in this story, like we hear from Genesis. It is much harder to believe in this kind of radical forgiveness when the victim has not gotten to hear those words from their abuser, please forgive me. I want to pause for a minute and be clear about what forgiveness really is and what it's not. Forgiveness has nothing to do with forgetting. In fact, I don't even think God wants us to forget. That's why we read these Old Testament stories over and over and over again so we don't forget. So we don't forget that even though when bad things happen to us, it's not our fault. It's the consequences of sin passed on from generation to generation. When I counsel people on forgiveness, I often tell them these words. Just because this bad thing has happened to you, that doesn't mean that's who you are. Just because this bad thing has happened to you, it doesn't mean that's who you are. Who you are is a child of God. A child of God like Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Esau like Joseph and his brothers, and like your brothers and sisters in Christ. Just because painful things happen in our lives doesn't mean that we have to stay stuck there. We all try to avoid the least amount of pain possible. That's why often we don't tell others, not even in our own church, about the painful things that happen to us. And that's often why we don't go and share our forgiveness with our brothers and sisters in Christ, because of fear. Because of fear of how they might respond to us. That's honestly what kept Joseph's brothers away all those years. It took his father's death for them all to finally return to Joseph to come together 
and to beg for forgiveness together. And Joseph gives those beautiful, beautiful words. Do not be afraid. I am not God. God intends to do good here in order to preserve what God promises to do in the future. One of the greatest role models of forgiveness in my life was my grandfather. He always had a practice of going to church every Sunday, no matter where he was, in the country or in the world. So at the end of his life, one Sunday, when we were on vacation as a family, Eric and I had the privilege to go with him to find a church, while the other family stayed back. He shared with us why he had this practice in his life. He said to us, when he was in the Navy in World War II, he prayed most nights that if God would get him through this next battle, if God would get him through this next mission, if God would finally bring him home safe and sound, he would be at church every Sunday. Now, I'm sure that was more than 70 times 7 that he would have worshipped and heard those words of forgiveness. But I don't think that he went just because he was a man of his word. I believe that he practiced forgiveness because he knew he needed it. He needed to hear every Sunday, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. My brothers and sisters in Christ, receiving God's forgiveness and sharing God's forgiveness is not easy. That's why we practice it here Sunday after Sunday. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness is a gift. Forgiveness is something that Jesus has already promised to us in our baptism. Forgiveness is something that we will promise Carson today. It's the same promise that God will give his parents when they attempt to raise him in the faith as he begins all his shenanigans to pull one over on them. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know what debt you need to settle in your life. I don't know what pain somebody has caused you recently. All I do know is that forgiveness is not easy. And it's not something that we can do on our own. That's why we have to keep coming here and practicing it together. So you know me by now, a month in, we're going to practice it, right? I'm going to invite you to get out your bulletins and turn back to the Old Testament reading from Genesis with me. Go to verse 19. And maybe, just maybe, you will get to share these words with somebody else who needs to hear it this week. Let us say together in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. Amen.
the good news. 